effects of climate change on Schnook salmon as a resource to cook inland. All right. Good luck. And I'm Andrew Palmer, and we are Sportification and Education from Wasilla. And um, so before we start, we're going to take a quick survey. Uh, how many of you, by show of hands, like fishing? Okay. How many of you like fishing for king salmon? Awesome. Now, how many of you would be sad if these salmon disappeared or weren't there in 20 or 30 years for your kids to enjoy? Pretty much everybody. So. Our project is on making sure that these salmon are around for not just us, but for generations to come and to keep them as a part of our lifestyle. So in our paper, we're gonna go over the life cycle of the salmon, the economic, ecological, and cultural importance of these fish. Um, we have a description area, or a description of our study area, which is a cook inlet. Um, we have the Chinook salmon and how they relate with climate change. Next, we've proposed an action plan to help um, keep them around due to the to effects that climate change has on them. And we have a way to test the efficacy of this plan and make sure that what we are doing is actually working and benefiting the salmon. So the life cycle of the king salmon is uh, basically the same as most anadromous fish. They start in fresh water, and as they grow up, they move down and go into the salt water, and then they return to breed and lay their eggs. And so, in the egg stage, the eggs are laid in the reds, which is a gravel bed, the bottom of the river, and they stay there until early spring, where they hatch and become the alvin, and the alvin stay relatively close or inside the red, where they feed off that yolk sac on the bottom, and they stay there until they emerge a few months later as fry. And the fry stay in the deeper water away from predators and they just grow, they eat bugs and um, develop. And then the par stage is kind of a transition stage between fry and smolt. And when they reach smolt stage, they move up into the surface waters of the river and the current then pushes them down towards the estuaries where they undergo smoltification and become adult salmon, which move out to the ocean and mature and become full grown. And they stay there for about two to seven years, depending on um, the, the fish and the run and all that. And then after that, they're the, the spawning salmon. They, they, mate, they lay their eggs and then they die off and the cycle restarts. Next, we'll have Alex Lippinchuk talking about the ecological, economic, and cultural importance of these salmon. So, as Andrew mentioned earlier, king salmon are very important uh, to us as Alaskans. And uh, ecologically, they have a long list of consumers that include puffins, murres, uh, bears, salmon sharks, and just about any, food, any animal that eats fish in Alaska can and will eat king salmon if they can. So, <clears throat> when in the ocean, king salmon accumulate more than 99% of their carbon, phosphorus, and nitrogen, which are vital uh, uh, nutrients that plants need to grow and to, be sh to, to, to thrive. And when king salmon make their way up the streams, they die, and these nutrients are deposited through the feces and urine of consumers, as well as decomposition. So economically, sam king salmon are important to the state of Alaska as well. Uh, sports fishing brings jobs such as guides, lodge staff, transport, and uh, specialty processors. And over $540 million was generated by sports fishing for anadromous fish that includes king salmon And uh, over this past year. And a study in Southeast Alaska found that for every resident caught uh, king salmon, it contributed $990 to the local economy, and for every king salmon caught by a non-resident fisherman, it contributed $900 to the local economy. And lastly, 
is one of our favorite fishing spots in the Massey Valley and that's Laguna Terres. And any, about any other, every other day, any day you go there, there's it's full and it brings business to the local, to the local stores and to the community. And that's why King Salmon are important to our to our city. So not only are they economically important through sports fishing, they're very important through commercial fishing. And if you look at this chart here on the left y-axis, we have thousands of fish caught, which is in the bars. And on the right, we have value of catch in millions, and that is in the red. So, and the x-axis is the time. So in 2014 and 15, the catch was about 500,000 fish, and the value of this catch was about $25 million. And um, And Alaska is the largest producer of wild caught king salmon. So not only is king salmon important to the economy and ecologically, it is very culturally important to Alaska as well. Not only is, is the king salmon the Alaska state fish, it has been fished for by native, native Alaskans for thousands of, thousands of years and has been a uh, very important food source for these Alaskan peoples. <coughs> uh, fishing for subsistence, salmon is prioritized by state and federal law and this protects it from, and prioritizes it so that it is around, around for these people that rely on it. And the Fish and Game, subsistence of, the Fish and Game Division of Subsistence estimates that salmon contribute 100 pounds to the diet of every subsistence fisherman every year. And along the state's west and interior rivers, this number increases to 300 pounds per year. Also, king salmon make up 16% of the subsistence harvest, and that rounds up, and the average was about, from 1994 to 2006, was about 165,000 fish, and this is why king salmon are important to Alaska. And I will give it to Casey Taylor on the description of the study area. So for our study area, we chose the Cook Inlet. Uh, the Cook Inlet is approximately 217 miles long and 10 miles wide. It's separated into three climate zones. The maritime climate zone, which is found along the water. The uh, continental climate zone, which is found on the land area and the transitional climate zone, which is separated into two parts, the upper half uh, following along the continental trends and the lower half following along the maritime trends. Uh, when you look at the food web of the Cook Inlet, uh, primary production starts with microalgae and macroalgae such as kelp forests. Moving up to primary consumers and prey of most of the animals in the Cook Inlet. You have bugs such as mosquitoes, copepods, dinoflagellates, and pteropods. Uh, then you move up to fish such as Pacific trout, sorry, Pacific herring, trout, walleye pollock, groundfish, white sturgeon, and salmon. Then you go on to predators such as bald eagles, orcas, peregrine falcons, harbor seals, sea lions, and bears. The Susitna River is the fourth largest Chinook salmon run in Alaska, and it's really close to our home Wasilla, as well as its tributaries are close. And this is why the Chinook salmon are very important to us. Next, Jessica will talk about climate change. Thank you. All right. So climate change can be defined as the average environmental conditions that are increasing and decreasing over an extended period of time superimposed upon normal ocean variability. So this would be basically changes in climate that are in addition to other changes such as seasonal changes which would be considered normal. So in the state of Alaska, this is going to look like things such as the earlier breakup of ice, the falling of permafrost, and erosion. So this photo was taken on the way to Valdez, and it is an example of erosion due to the melting of ice. 
So climate change and its effects on the ocean specifically. So this is gonna be things like creating a hypoxic environment in the ocean because warm water doesn't absorb oxygen as well as cold water does. Warming water temperatures, ocean acidification, and coral bleaching. So specifically, the three that we're gonna focus on that affect salmon are the ones starred down here. So salmon have a very narrow range of tolerance when it comes to the temperature of the water. So this table displays the lethal threshold for different types of salmon. Chinook salmon are the ones outlined in red. And so the water temperature cannot exceed this degree Celsius or else it would be lethal to the salmon species. So note that in the egg incubation stage and the developmental stages of the salmon, the lethal threshold is significantly lower by five degrees Celsius than in other stages of life because they have an even narrower range of tolerance in these stages. So in addition to direct effects of climate change to Chinook salmon, there's also a number of indirect effects and this would include things like making them more susceptible to bacterial infections, such as Ig and Colin Nevis. So in 2002, in the Klamath River down in Oregon, there was an outbreak of these two bacterial infections and it devastated salmon populations. So, and temperature was seen to be the driving, out, like driving force behind the outbreak. So another indirect effect of climate change on Chinook salmon would be ocean acidification which is the process by which car atmospheric carbon dioxide gets dissolved into the ocean where it combines with water to create carbonic acid, which then can be detrimental to the sea plankton pteropods, which are a important food source to juvenile Chinook salmon. So on the left is a healthy pteropod, and on the right is a pteropod whose shell is beginning to dissolve because pteropods build their shells out of calcium carbonate, which dissolves in carbonic acid. So when, um, sorry, when the pH of the ocean begins to lower and it becomes less basic, the shells of the pteropods begin to dissolve. And now Shimmy is going to talk about our proposed action plan. So our proposed action plan is a combination of selective breeding and facilitative adaptation, which was inspired by building coral reef resilience through assisted evolution, but the ultimate goal of our plan is to alleviate the effects of climate change on Chinook salmon populations. Because it is a process of assisted evolution, we are going to first locate thermal tolerant individuals from nature, and while this may prove to be difficult, we are going to, um, well, this may prove to be difficult. In a study done by Everett and Steve in 2014, they were able to locate the said population in Lower Crab Creek, Washington. So in the graph as shown behind me, in graph A, it shows the range of tolerance for average normal salmon, and graph B will show the predicted temperatures and the number of population of salmon that would survive under such conditions. The second step of our plan is to relocate the eggs, the fertilized eggs, from the thermal tolerant individuals into available facilities, such as the Agluna hatchery on the Kinnick River. And once the chicken salmon has reached the albin stage, we're going to mimic the external conditions with temperatures of around 8 to 9 degrees Celsius and fluctuated around 2 degrees Celsius so that they will be used to the natural environment. And once they've reached the frog stage, we are going to expose them to thermal stress tests. So with this, we are going to take out 100 fries and relocate them to other tanks to perform these tests. So with that, we're going to increase the temperature by 1 degree Celsius every other day so that the population can acclimate and reestablish their point of equilibrium before we raise the temperature and we are going to remove the expired individuals and continue the test until the desired effects are seen. Okay, so the final step of our plan 
is to inject the fry with a PIT tag, which stands for Passive Integrated Transponder. And we are going to release these individuals into local creeks and rivers where they will be monitored. And next is Jessica talking about the efficacy of our plan. Okay, so like I Andrew, Andrew mentioned earlier, salmon spend two to seven years of their life in the open ocean. So it would take a little bit of time before we got the results of our plan back. So, like Shari said, we would be monitoring them using pit tags. And so, to monitor whether or not our plan was effective, we would monitor the hatch site and the release site of the salmon to see if they return in greater numbers and in better health. And using the pit tags, it's an internal marking, so it wouldn't fade over time, and it also has no um, significant health impacts to the fish. So in terms of testing the health of the ecosystem to prove that we didn't save the salmon at the cost of the rest of the ecosystem, one way that we could do this is by monitoring the biodiversity of the ecosystem, because biodiversity is a good indicator of ecosystem health, productivity, and resilience. So one way that we can quantify biodiversity is by using the Shannon's Index. So <laughs> agency index, and the higher number, the more biodiversity in an ecosystem. N stands for the number of individuals, or number of species in the ecosystem, and P sub I is the number of individuals in each species. So by using annual biodiversity checks, we can monitor the health of our ecosystem and prove that it's staying healthy. And now Casey's going to conclude. So today, we talked about the different stages of the life cycle of salmon, the ecological, economical, and cultural importance of salmon, and how if they were lost, it would be devastating. Uh, we described our study area, the Cook Inlet, the abiotic and biotic factors. Uh, we went over climate change and the greenhouse effect on oceans. We proposed our action plan, which is assisted evolution, and and explained how to verify the action plan using the Shannon Index. So uh, we would like to thank our coaches, um, Mr. Bailey and Ms. Anderson, because without them we wouldn't have been able to do this, and we're really grateful for them. So um, that wraps up our presentation, and are there any questions? <laughs> of your plan. So you say you want to uh, monitor the diversity of the ecosystem. That's obviously a very, very big target. So knowing what you do about um, uh, pink salmon, can you pinpoint a couple of specific elements or particular parts of the ecosystem that you would monitor? Um, specifically, probably the anything like that's directly related to the food change to food chain to Chinook salmon, so things like things that they prey on, and um, abiotic factors that specifically impact Chinook salmon. Okay, and I, I guess my question was also going into the direction, are you focusing, or are you thinking about focusing on the marine phase of salmon, or also on the freshwater phase? Mainly the freshwater phase, just because that's where they would be returning back to. So you addressed <coughs> thermal stress in the species itself, but I mean, the, the changing temperatures will affect prey and there might be potential impacts to the habitat. So how would you address those concerns in the management plan? Okay, so while we're, our focus is actually on the Chinook salmon, but we can expand our area of research should we reach the point of addressing other organisms in the environment. Hi, thank you. Um, I have a question. How, um, how would you address the, 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 you're going to be, by doing this breeding program, you're going to be limiting the genetic diversity of the salmon stock. Um, and how do you, um, how are you going to address that? And do you expect your stock to start breeding with um, what we would consider wild salmon or salmon that Need to be more dealing with. Um, that is our hope that once these individuals have become temperature tolerant 
and they're in the wild, they're going to breed with the um, wild salmon so that they can pass on the traits that they have acquired through the stress test. Do you expect that to affect the genetic diversity of your stock? Um, hopefully not, because we are releasing them back into the wilderness. So with genetic diversity though, since you're releasing them into the wild, there's still a large pool of salmon that they can mate with and breed with, which will keep the genetic, genetic diversity up there because there's so many different genes that are still going to be there. And so we're just adding the traits that will help keep them um, surviving and growing. You guys have an estimate of the cost of this plan of uh, bringing these salmon up there? Um, as of right now, we do not because it is just um, it's a proposed action plan. We don't have um, the sources to go into it fully yet. It's just it's an idea that we think, if implemented, could do a lot of good. Um, it would still take some research to find an exact number. However, it, it would be it would be somewhat expensive just due to the challenge. But without challenge, we may never get results that we need. So. that was done in Australia. And what they did is they took individuals from the wild that were seen to be tolerant of the ocean's pH and the hybrids actually, and they removed them to another area so that they can breed with other populations. Our plan is to keep doing the system until a number of population has the sad traits, which is why we tag them and look for their return and check to see if the population in the region are containing these traits. So it was part of, it was P sub I, and that was just the number of individuals in each species. Um, so you talked about assisted evolution. Have you found any research to suggest that um, genetic modification of salmon embryos to make this temperature tolerancy trait a dominant gene would be effective in carrying that gene throughout wild In this study by Everett and Sieb in 2014, they looked at the genetic trait for salmon, and it was shown that part of their alleles is, um, is the controlling factor over their temperature tolerance. So by um, using the stratus, we are hoping that the traits will show up and pass on through further generations. Uh, how do Chinook, uh, Chinook salmon stack up economically compared to other species? Like uh, in Prince William Sound, where we live, they their price per pound is rather large, but economically they're not wildly important because just not as many of them are caught. Is that different in uh, your region? Well, that's exactly the problem. There's not as many of them, and we hope to change that. Okay, thank you. Uh, 
Okay, so the, the temperature varies um, anywhere from zero in the, in the winter to 12 to 14 in the summer. But um, with the increase of temperature that's been going on, globally it's, I think, 0 0.6 degrees every year, um, you could expect it to rise within the next 20 or 30 years, just depending on fluctuations and other things and factors that go into that. And so realistically, if this continues to happen as it is, um, the king salmon population will go to a steady decline through the next few generations. Um, so salmon, they return usually to the same spot that they were um, released at or hatched at. And so with like the Eklutna hatchery, they release them there and then the return comes back. And that's why so many people like fishing there, is all these um, king salmon that were released there come back in large runs. And so there's, there's a good school of fish that you can go and catch. And so it's the same as just a wild king salmon returning to where they came from. So it's assisted evolution, so we're not actually genetically modifying them. We're just taking them and breeding for the traits that we wish to see in the fish. And our research was specifically towards king salmon, but if you were to put it towards other species, it would work as well. So. So I don't believe we came across this in our research, but um, so when it comes to our salmons returning, we aren't like looking to catch them, we're just seeing that they're coming back in greater numbers. So, um, can you repeat the question one more time, sorry. Um, what is the advantage of just doing a selective breeding instead of uh, letting them naturally evolve and adapt on their own? Um, just because climate change is happening at a fairly rapid pace, and so in waiting for this process to happen naturally, we're just trying to speed it up so that we can save the population before it declines. So much.